Vision. Welcome back to the D-List, and now on to my top 15 favorite Phineas and Ferb episodes. So, Number 15. The Curse of Candace. After seeing a teen vampire drama, a mishap at the theater causes Candace to worry that she's becoming a vampire. You really rented a bat? Yeah, I know. It seemed like a good idea at the time. Oh no, I think it's really paying off here. A fear that's only spurred on by Phineas and Ferb fulfilling their friends' requests, and by Doof making everything a little more old-fashioned. Yeah, my dad said I could drive it, just as long as I didn't get a scratch on it. Oh, my dad's gonna kill me! Why, dude? He's not scratched. It was inevitable that a show with a teenage girl protagonist would eventually do some sort of Twilight homage, but to make it more fun for themselves, they make it more of an action movie. Jared! Michael! Don't do this! <laughs> it's the end of the line, Jared. I expect this from your kind, Michael. Football players, I mean. And when your werewolf character is a Michael J. Fox cameo, and your Edward and Bella characters are Stephen Moyer and Anna Paquin cameos, you're really making this more for yourself than for the Twilight crowd. And I applaud you for it. It sounds like a vampire to me. Number 14. Sipping with the enemy. While Phineas and the gang prepare a magic show, Vanessa and Monty reconnect in a coffee shop. Cappuccino, Cappuccino with chocolate, chocolate powder on top and a ginger, ginger scone, scone, please. And two straws, no doubt. A coffee shop Doof is headed toward to stock up on espresso to power his coolinator. Yeah, man, you know, it's all about my blog. You know, I blog about blogs that blog about other blogs. So Vanessa enlists Perry's help to keep Doof distracted. I've talked before about my love for the show's ability to weave long-term character growth throughout the beats of the formula, and this is a prime example of that as we see a relationship begin to sprout. Monty and Vanessa's flirting is surprisingly grounded and natural considering the zany, over-the-top world they live in. Yeah, where's your dad? Dad's date ruininator. <laughs> so this is a date? Well, isn't it? And they are an agreeable couple, but they don't see eye to eye on everything. If I had a nickel for every time I got the your father couldn't make it, he's working late call. But I guess that's really your dad's fault. So what exactly do you mean by that? Leading to an instance where Vanessa actually defends her dad, showing some payoff in their growing relationship as well. I'll have you know, my father is a misunderstood genius. But Monty and Vanessa's disagreements don't get in the way of their desire for a second date. Mind flip! Number 13, a real boy. In the first Norm-centric episode, Doof sarcastically responds to Rodney's sexist assertion that having a son is better than having a daughter, but when he worries that Vanessa overheard him and took it the wrong way, he tries to make things right with the forget about it innator, all the time ignoring Norm, who wishes Doof would treat him like a son. Meanwhile, Candace resorts to hypnotism to get over her obsession with busting the boys. When James Braid published the rationale of somnambulism in which he invented the term hypnotism, named after the Greek god Hypnos. How do you even know that? It's written on your poster. Apparently, he also invented the comb-over. Freaky. Why would I have bought that poster? Yeah, this episode is funny and entertaining like all the others, but Norm's loneliness and desire for Doof's approval is downright heartbreaking. Doof's genuine love for his daughter tends to embody his most redeeming features, but his cruelty to Norm's face is about the evilest thing we ever see him do. Well, in this timeline, anyway. I should probably make a whole video about Norm someday. One final things considered, wanna be a real boy, but I don't wanna sound embittered. But thanks for asking. Seriously. Number 12. Ladies and gentlemen, meet Max Modem. When Linda is invited to bring back the Lindana persona for an 80s revival show, Candace is excited for the prospect of fame, but Lawrence is worried that she'll finally realize just how far out of his league she is. So the boys help pass him off as an 80s has-been of his own. I think you're ready for the big time. Correction, I am ready to have once been part of the big time. Meanwhile, Doof tries to stage an alien invasion. I want to see the clown. Sally, he's no clown, he's a nut job. Linda's past as Lindana had come up several times before, but this was the first time we see how intimidated Lawrence is by this past. Look at her, boys, she's magnificent. And you will be too, Dad. But of course, he has nothing to worry about. Their love is stronger than the allure of one hit wonderdom. I've got an absolutely wonderful husband back home. Lawrence and Linda are a really underrated pair of cartoon parents. The important thing is, finally, Richard O'Brien gets a musical number. You know, I feel strangely comfortable like this. Number 11. 
Finding Mary McGuffin. When Lawrence accidentally sells Candace's beloved doll to Doof at a garage sale, she enlists the newly detective-obsessed Phineas and Ferb to track down the aptly named Mary McGuffin. So they scour the Tri-State area using every detective persona they can conjure. Aren't you a little young to be detectives? If it's all the same to you, ma'am, we'll ask the questions. But Doof has given the doll to Vanessa because it was the only thing she wanted as a child, causing Vanessa to reassess her dorky dad. The show has a lot of fun with detective homages, from film noir classics to cop shows throughout the decades, and the episode marks a major step forward in Vanessa and Doof's relationship, for better and for worse. Wow, that is evil! Honey, I am so proud of you! It felt good, didn't it? Yeah, we can build on this. Not so bad at dead after all. Number 10. Bullseye. While Phineas and Ferb play with a giant dart and Linda tries her hand at modern art, Lawrence goes to the wrong address and accidentally enters the Leader of Love Muffin competition, facing off against Doof and Rodney in an evil off he is not even close to qualified for. Oh, excuse me, is this the way to the stage? It looks like we have a late entry. This episode is primarily an extended comedy sketch, serving as a wonderful vehicle for Lawrence and his oh-so-British politeness. I don't know how you did it. I don't even think I understood the event, but... Good show! But when actual stakes come into play and Lawrence starts to actually become evil, the episode is another testament to how much Perry cares about his family and how well he knows them, and just how strong the family is. So how'd it go, Dad? I'm not absolutely sure, boys, but I think I just became king of the pharmacists. Number 9. The Beak. When Phineas and Ferb try out some new skateboarding armor, they accidentally become a superhero. As you do. Ah, this is so much worse than hitting the ah! But this new beacon of hope brings a new villain out of hiding, so the beak must fight off this villain using every superhero pun in his arsenal. Maybe this will be our hit. Yeah, see, cause cause he hit him. I'm not an idiot, Charles. But the more ominous threat is that for once, Phineas has to keep a secret from Isabella. Meanwhile, Dew finally tries the direct approach and just tells everyone he already took over the tri-state area. Some people are more gullible than others. It's fun to see the Phineas and Ferb half of the show take on the action mantle, while the Doof and Perry half takes up the character moments and sillier gags. Melanie, could you come in here? That would be a bowl of mints. I've got my finger in a bowl of mints? Yes, you do. Oh, well that would explain why there's so many buttons. And it's quite the change of pace to see a self-appointed supervillain who has no connection to Love Muffin. You can call me Kaka Poo Poo! <laughs> it's a family name, loosely translated as The Strong Fist or That Strong Fist. Thank you very much! Guest star Ben Stiller is perfectly cast as the snooty villain, only complimented by his real-life wife Christine Taylor's cameo as the villain's wife. Oh! Where have you been? Oh, hi, honey. Shush, oh. you! You were supposed to take me shopping! I need me some more throwing chairs! Narrator Guy is out. Peace! Number 8. Phineas and Ferb's Quantum Boogaloo. Phineas and Ferb go 20 years into the future for a tool they need, but when the 35-year-old Candace sees them, some repressed busting urges rise to the surface. And she goes back to the start of that summer to put an end to their nonsense once and for all. But doing so causes more damage than she anticipated. This is a sequel to the first Time Machine episode, It's About Time, and it's a sequel to the pilot episode, Roller Coaster, and it's the show's version of Back to the Future Part 2, a movie I just may love wholeheartedly. The series has always shown how Phineas and Doof's projects keep each other in check, but this was the first to blatantly explore the consequences if there were to be an imbalance. And with the number of timelines at play here, it's hard to tell what from this episode actually has any consequences on future episodes, and in this particular case, that's part of the fun. Number 7. My Fair Goalie. The Fletcher side of the family comes to visit, and from the looks of their eyes, they might come from the Ardman region of the UK. Ferb's cousins think his time in the States has Americanized him, and they doubt he could even play a game of football anymore. Phineas ups the ante, as always, by suggesting the previously hypothetical Football X7. Sweaty Man Playing Games Network presents Football X7. Theoretical, speculative, conjecture, or not that what we just said with the conjecture thing. But Ferb's nervous due to an unexpected curse involving an emu attack. 
Meanwhile, Candace goes full Eliza Doolittle and tries to get proper English training to become more ladylike to impress Jeremy. What, do polite people not have bookshelves in your country? Linda's frustrated when Lawrence's brother keeps beating him in petty competitions. Uh, Lawrence, what's going on here? I've seen you put on more shirts than that. And Doof's sick, so he's trying to sit this one out. This episode is one of the most Ferb-centric, as he faces the duality of his English origins and his new American home and family, and he comes to the only logical conclusion. Actually, lads, I'm not a Brit or a Yank. I'm just Ferb. But most of the joys of this episode come from the onslaught of non-sequiturs, absurdist gags, and quotable turns of phrase. I guess I could smack a little gob myself. Like a comfy old knit woolen friend named Joycey Terrific from the Hinterland. <laughs> Mummy, that man's name is a palindrome. Look away, Johnny. Look away. Is it my imagination or is that a Football X7 stadium? It's your imagination. That's just a mailbox. But there is one on this side of the bus. Number six. Bully Bromance Breakup When Baljeet has finally had enough of Buford's bullying, the two go their separate ways. Doof enlists Buford's help in taking over the tri-state area, while Baljeet is determined to climb Danville Mountain without the aid of inventions, leaving Phineas and Ferb jonesing for a fix. The longer the show went on, the more the two previously distinct halves of the series started to cross over, and this was one of the funniest examples. Doof and Buf make an entertaining duo, and I would have loved to see them paired together in more episodes, but of course it doesn't take long for Baljeet and Buford to realize how much they miss each other. And Buford saves the day, but also gets his comeuppance, so everybody wins. And Phineas's invention withdrawals are disturbingly hilarious. Apparently the one thing in life he wasn't prepared for was being forbidden to prepare. If we hadn't been able to invent something soon, I was going to scream. Number 5. Meepless in Seattle. Meep is back, desperately trying to stop Big Mitch from ingesting pure Cutonium and taking over their planet with cuteness. But Doof ingests the Cutonium first, trying to cover when Perry finds him once again meeting up with Peter the Panda. That's just great. What kind of a world are we living in where I got of a mysterious urn found in a trench without undergoing major physical transmogrification, really. The first Meep episode ended with a completely fake teaser for a sequel episode full of all sorts of trailer cliches. So when it came time to actually make the actual sequel, they had to work in those sequences. And of course, by and large, they subvert the expected context from those scenes. I want your hat on my desk. Because it rains a lot in Seattle, and I'd like to spray it with this cool new waterproofing treatment. But it's not only a sequel to The Chronicles of Meep, it's also another sequel to It's About Time, the first time travel episode which introduced Peter. Oh gee, what a surprise, a Phineas and Ferb episode expertly tying disparate storylines together. And while Isabella's role in the first Meep episode was primarily comic relief, here she gets to actually save the day because she's a freaking fireside girl, dang it! It is a genuine shame that they never got around to making Meet Me in St. Louis. Yes, I'm just a guy who's a sucker for the sounds of mass transit! Number 4. Nerds of a Feather Phineas and Ferb are off to the big sci-fi fantasy convention to meet their special effects hero, Clive Addison, played by Kevin Smith. I became a special effects artist to join the nations of this earth together in peace and hope. Unfortunately, Irving and Albert's sibling rivalry leads to an all-out nerd war. They actually think all those silly magic elves movies are better than Space Adventure's epic science fiction genius. Well, I... Stumbleberry Thinkpad and the lost shadow of Darkling Tower alone was smarter and more realistic than all the even-numbered space adventure movies combined. And Phineas and Ferb get stuck in the middle. Television does have a long history of attempting to portray some of the struggles of being a nerd, and most shows throughout history focused on the struggles of interacting with non-nerds, primarily jocks and bullies. But never before this episode had I seen such a great portrayal of so many of the frustrations from within nerd culture, such as the us versus them mentality that pressures so many people into choosing one franchise and dismissing all others and shaming people who dare like the wrong thing. These Momo nuts are such an embarrassment. <laughs> Seriously. Whether it's the rift between the sci-fi and fantasy camps, or Candace's embarrassment at her own love for Ducky Momo, this episode provided a sadly all-too-relatable look at some of the attitudes that make it a little harder to claim geek pride, when all you want to do is enjoy the thing you like. And that alone would make a really great episode, 
but then it gets pushed over the limit with another subplot. A fugitive semi-aquatic special forces amateur stage magician framed for a crime he didn't commit. The 1865 assassination of Abraham Lincoln joins forces with a rogue trillionaire inventor extreme fighting champion from the future. Doof and Puss, a laugh out loud hilarious pastiche of 80s action shows that Doof is pitching to another Hollywood big shot played by Seth MacFarlane. Just a thought though, can we give the platypus a girlfriend? And it's exactly the type of ridiculous, silly, awesome show that would inspire a convention attending cult following. This episode is an indictment of the toxic elements of geek culture at its worst, but it's also a celebration of the greatness of geek culture at its best, and how our favorite characters, stories, and franchises can fill us with joy when we need it most. I gotta say guys, that was hands down the best special effects show ever, and I've been a burning man. Number three. Okay, give it a chance. We want your honest opinion. We know it's a little weird. Ferb TV. You know how I just mentioned those doof and puss sequences from Nerds of a Feather? How about a whole episode of just stuff like that? Essentially, this is a sketch show starring the supporting cast of Phineas and Ferb, where they headline a whole bunch of fake commercials and fake shows within shows. Buford Judge is a cooking reality show, Baljeet is a doctor ninja, Susie and Norm of all pairings have a sitcom, but hey, he makes a great addition to the Hall of Sitcom Norms. The Klimp Loon and the Babyhead host a variety show. Actually, that one makes a lot of sense. And I would absolutely watch any of these spin-offs. You know, as well as the Fireside Girls, and the Alcophiles, and Doof 101, and any of the other potential spin-offs that have ever been teased. You know what, Disney? Just, just go ahead and make Fur TV an actual network, okay? And finally, we get our first look at what Ducky Momo is actually like. Poor Ducky Momo. Still can't find the bridge. Can you help him find the bridge? Behind you! It's behind oh, you! Cry out loud, just turn around! Rotate your butt! A show about desperately trying to get someone to notice something. I have no idea why that would have resonated with a young Candace. Number 2. Road to Danville. Doof has the title role in a play, so he tries to speed along his usual routine by sending Perry to the middle of the desert. But Perry drags him along too, and now they have to put aside their differences if Doof's gonna make it back in time for Curtain. Do it for the orphans! I might perform in front of someday if I ever do a show in an orphanage. Functionally, this is a bottle episode where the bottle is the desert. Why do we always see cow skulls in the desert? And why do you only see the skull? Did the body die somewhere else? It makes no sense. And it's 11 minutes of Doof, Perry, and the full emotional spectrum of their mutual love-hate relationship. You are what's been holding me back all these years. Oh, very clever. All the rivalry, bitterness, insensitivity, compassion, and supportiveness that comes with it. And man, do I love watching these best friends and mortal enemies do their thing. I want you to know that you are appreciated, Perry the Platypus. You are appreciated. And my number one favorite Phineas and Ferb episode, Roller Coaster the Musical. In this episode, Phineas' plan for the day is basically to remake the pilot episode, except now with songs. Hey, it was one of the very few episodes that didn't have any. We'll do all the same things, except we'll break into spontaneous singing and choreography with no discernible music source. Hmm. What assurance would we have that everyone else would also break into song and do the same thing? I don't know. I think they probably will. Fair enough. I'm in. Right off the bat, we know we're in for a special ride when the opening number is filled with visual homages to a number of beloved classic musicals. And then all those formula beats that the pilot episode introduced finally get the musical accompaniment they deserve. Ooh, I'm gonna tell Mom, and when she sees what you are doing, you are going down! It's going down, it's going down when I get Mom to see This ridiculous monstrosity Every day What you doing? What you doing? What's a day's activity? Mom, look. Don't roll your eyes at me. Mom, look. Just come over and see. They built a submarine, a time machine, a haunted house, a made scream, drove cattle through the mall, built a giant bowling ball, blew me up to 50 feet, a cherry dragged me down the street. <gasps> Aren't you a little young to build a roller coaster? Yes, yes I am. Well, I must say that I'm really quite impressed. But all your permits are in order. Don't forget the bricks and mortar. And if you need a power loader, be my guest. Back in Game of Stop, I always had to keep it real. Permanent safes and titles, more bubbles. Scream if 
you want more. And yeah, being a remake, there's a lot of recycled animation in this episode, but you can't even pretend to call this episode lazy, because for every repeated scene from the pilot, there's then a brand new, visually elaborate, intricately animated musical number. It combines everything that made the pilot great with everything that made every episode since the pilot great. And the episode wraps things up with basically every character we've seen from every episode so far coming together to share the central thesis of the whole series. Every day's a brand new Baby deal. <sighs> and there you have it, my 30 favorite Phineas and Ferb episodes that fall within the parameters I laid out in part one of this video. So, what are your favorite Phineas and Ferb episodes? And how excited are you for Milo Murphy's Law? Let's discuss this in the comments, and until next time, Dave is out. Peace!